you know, if we truly believe our estimate of demand is as good as it's going to get, okay, then we would probably just order that amount. I mean, if we're wrong, oh well, okay. We we order that amount. We would make fourteen thousand two hundred fifty. But if if demand wasn't quite as high, okay, fine. Then we still made thirteen thousand seven hundred fifty. Okay. Oh, demand was higher. Okay, we just still made. Oh, demand was higher. Well. We made the same amount the rest of the time. We just lost out on the opportunity to have made more because we didn't order it anymore. Okay. So you can look at all around it and try to figure out, you know, what would that mean to you? Um, that, that, and that's what it's for. That's what the data table is for, so that you can do that, so that you can look at it and, and make determinations on what you want to order. But that's going to be a very normal part of our modeling process. This is a really tiny model that was to get us thinking in lines of put your input in one place, you know, do other things, make other calculations from there. After it's complete, do what if analysis after the fact to see. Because there's there's all kinds of things we could do with this model. We could try to renegotiate the you know prices with these people if we wanted to but maybe we're just a small vendor and we don't have that kind of control those those are the numbers and that's what you do um, we'll see but okay so that is actually in the textbook so if you wanted to go back in chapter 2 and look at 2.1 to get further explanation around it you would have that but another thing that they do in chapter 2 we're going on to look at more models there's a lot of times with the modeling that we do it's just bigger than we can create from scratch in class. And when I say bigger, it's not like hugely realistic, but it's big enough and, you know, where we still can mostly see it on the screen, but anyway, it's big enough that we're not going to in class develop it. We're, ju we're just not. So there's a lot of times we're going to have shells already created for us. Well, one of the ones that already has a shell for it, but also illustrates something else they're trying to show you in chapter two, is we always refer to it as the time value question because what they're doing is they want to introduce to you some financial functions um, into a model into the modeling process because we haven't gotten to solver when we get to solver that takes us into a whole new world of optimization but for right now we're just kind of looking at different models and this is one of the models that we're going to look at whoops let's look at it out of PowerPoint first because if we don't look at it here we don't really know what we're doing we're going to be making a selection between two different machines to produce our product, which, regardless of the machine we choose, will have a 40 cent per unit profit margin and an anticipated demand of 10,000 units. But from that point forward, the machines vary. Okay, the product doesn't vary, but the machines <laughs> vary. They have different maintenance costs, they have different annual production amounts. They have different useful life expectancy. They have different prices, and in each case, their prices are in a structure of um, quantity price breaks. And so if you look here, if you bought six machine ones, you'd pay only $700, but if you bought six machine twos, you'd pay 650 So the information is all given here, and this information is all on the worksheet when we get to it. And here's what we're going to do. Oops, wrong one. That one. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we have a little upfront calculation we have to do, okay, to get to the point where we can do this, and that's describe the annual cash flows. Because the annual cash flows are what make the financial, calculating financial measures is what make those, those possible. I mean, we have to get the cash flows all laid out so that we can do NPVs and IRRs and paybacks and things like that. And those financial measures help us choose between options, between projects, between machines, between whatever. Okay. And so that's what we're going to end up doing. After the fact, we'll do a data table, although I doubt seriously we'll get to that data, that what if data table today. That's probably going to be something that's to carry over until next time. But given, before we do what if analysis, just with the numbers that we do have, We'll, we'll see which would be the best machine selection given the current numbers before we do what it counts. Okay, so here we go. It's all kind of laid out here. You see the, 
the maintenance costs, the life expectancies, the production amounts, different for each machine. You see the unit margin and the expected demand here, as well as a, a discount rate that we'll need when we get down to the, the other measures. Those three things are here. They're the same for machine two. So what you will notice is that if you looked at cell C9, I didn't retype 40 cents. I referenced B9. Here, I referenced B11. Here, I referenced B13. That's very important. We're not going to type the same number in more than one time. It also, if those were not referencing this other cells, then some of the things we do later wouldn't work. Okay? And so we want to always make sure that as much as possible within our you know, ability to do so, that we reference, that we only type a hard-coded value in one time. And then from that point forward, we reference to use it. Okay, okay so we're going to get to all this financial stuff later. But before we can actually get to that, you may notice that the price isn't filled in up here. The price mm -hmm. isn't filled in on the initial cost of each machine. Um, if you look, okay, I did this in the last class, this drives me crazy, I've loved it for years. You really aren't, you really don't need zero at the beginning of that table. Okay, you really should just start with one. But over here you'll, not, you'll notice the quantity price breaks here. If you bought only one machine, it's 1200 From two to four, it's 900 Yeah, this is machine one. You, you can see what was listed out on the PowerPoint on here. Okay. So, we have a filled in price because in order to know price, we have to know what? We have to know the quantity. We have to know how many machines we're buying. Okay, well that, we can calculate right here. How do we know how many machines we need to buy? Right. So you've got 10,000 units you would like to produce, okay? You've got a machine for machine one, this is annual numbers, that can reduce 1,200 for each one, right? Okay. So when you look at that, you have a choice here, okay? It tells you you need 8.333 machines to meet your 10,000. You have a couple of choices. One of them is not buying a third of a machine, okay? That's not one of the choices. You can decide that you're going to meet demand, or you can decide that you're going to buy the number of machines closest to whatever this comes out, and if you don't meet demand, then that's, then that's the reality of the situation, you don't meet demand, okay? You just, you know, you're just under. Because obviously one way you're kind of going over capacity, so you know, we get it, it's a trade-off here. In this decision, in this particular problem, we're deciding we want to meet demand, okay? Which means we have to buy how many machines? Nine. We have to buy nine machines. So yes, then you do have to round up. If that's your decision that you're gonna meet demand, then you do have to round up. So I'm gonna have to round up, and obviously we're trying to get, the whole idea is we're trying to get this to zero decimal places because we're not gonna buy partial machines, okay? So we're gonna round that up. The 10,000 divided by the 1,200, we're gonna round it up, and it's gonna tell us, of course, that we need nine machines. Everything that's in here is a reference to something in this column, so I'm easily able to just copy this over, and I discover that I need 11 of the other machines. I don't know what that original number was. I've ever, never actually divided it out because I've always done the first one and you know drug it over. But regardless of what it is, 10 point something maybe, probably, okay? I doubt if it's exactly really 11. But, you know, it's probably 10 point something. We have to buy 11 machines if our choice is that we want to meet all of our demand. Okay. okay. Now we can fill the price in. How do we get the price filled in here? <laughs> you know we need nine machines. You could look over there and you can see that we're going to pay how much. Okay. How's Excel going to look over there and see? Index. Not the index. Do you look up? <laughs> Do you look up? 
So with a VLOOKUP, we're going to recognize that, yes, we need nine machines, and that over here in this table, I don't really have to pick up that third column, but I might as well. I haven't heard anything one way or the other. We'll go over there and look what column contains the answer that I want. Two. Column two. And what kind of a lookup is this? Is it an exact match? Somebody say yes or no. No. And why is it not? No, but now I have nine. Okay, now I have nine. And so that, that calculation is behind me. I, I'm now looking up nine machines, but it isn't really about how many machines I'm looking up. It's when I'm looking up the number of machines. Is that an exact match or is it a, a range approximate match? And why? Right, so if this was an exact match, what would my choices be? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's it. Those would be my only choices. Okay. Are those my only choices of machines that they could purchase? No. I mean, if our production demand goes way up, we may need 15, 16, 17, 18 machines. Okay. You would not be accounting for anything larger than 10 if you put vaults in here. <coughs> this isn't, those aren't your exact 10 choices. And in fact, these tables could have been set up completely differently. When I say tables, it's in one table now. It could have been in two separate tables. And it could have had, let me go ahead and put your in here so I don't have my little tool tip uh, going over the edge. Okay. I could have had a table for machine one. It would have had a one, a two, a five, and a ten. Okay. It, a table for machine two would have had a one, a three, a seven, and a ten. And then you would have known probably that it wasn't an exact match. This looks like, because I listed them all out, because I put them together in one table, it was easier to do that. Okay. It, it, again, does it all, do we all have to think the same way? No, step, 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 that's right, okay? Could have been in two separate tables, that would have been fine. We put it in one table, therefore we listed everything out, one through 10, it was a little easier that way to get the numbers in there. But the bottom line is those aren't our only 10 choices. Someone could purchase more than 10 machines. Okay, and so we definitely this needs to be true. Okay, and, and this does say 700 as we would expect. I'm essentially, I'm not going to try copying this because then I just have to change too many things or go back and, yeah, not. I'm essentially just doing the same thing again, doing a VLOOKUP for the number of machine twos that's, that are required in that same table. But this time, where's my answer? Column three. Column three. And you know, if we hadn't done it right the first time, this might have triggered us because we would have seen that we're trying to order 11, 11's not in there. That might have triggered us to realize that this needed to be true and not false. Okay. okay. And, and as 11 machines get the best possible price of $300. So you can see that it got, you know, that it picked up on the right thing. All right, so it was kind of necessary to get these things in before we could start doing this. Okay. But, but the whole idea behind, um, well, being able to, sorry, being able to do these cash flows, we have to think of several different things. Let me, I'm sorry, I'm thinking and formatting all at the same time. To be able to do these performance measures, we have to get the cash flows. To be able to do the cash flows, there's several things we want to kind of think through. So I'm going to start out with, you know, where would, what happens in what we refer to as time zero? We buy, machines. we buy the machines. And so the very first thing that happens is that we buy nine, at this moment, we're buying nine machines for $700 a piece. But we've got to be really careful about this because that number it, in an cash flow, that, that was an outflow. I mean, we spent that. So that needs to show up as a negative number. So I don't care where you throw the little negative sign in, but you throw a negative sign in there somewhere. 
Okay, let me back up because I didn't talk about something else first. One of the things that we're doing here with these particular financial functions is taking into account the time value of money, which that you guys are juniors or maybe even some seniors at this point, you have had finance classes and so you are familiar with that concept of time value of money and how that works and you know that it's better for you to get a thousand dollars today than a thousand dollars a year from now it's worth more to you why because you could do something with it you could invest it you could make more money off of it and so therefore you know that's what we feel like the sooner you get it better okay so before we fill in the rest of this Let's look at these two different projects that we have here. In project A, in the first time period, you get $10 million, then 20, then 30, then 40, then 50. In project B, it's the reverse. You get 50 million in the first time period, then 40, then 30, then 20, then 10. And if you were just not taking the time value of money into account, if you were just adding these up, then they would obviously be the same. Okay, this is the same numbers as well. But when you know about the time value of money, you'd much prefer which project? A or B? B. B. The one that you get the money faster. Okay? That you get your money. Because here is what here is what is happening. In order to really compare apples to apples, what we do is we discount this all back to today's dollars and compare it to each other. Okay? Because knowing what we know, that there is a difference in when you get money, then we want to get everything back. And here's what happens. The one in time one gets discounted back at whatever rate you're using, gets discounted back one time period. The one in, in the second time period gets discounted back two time periods. This one gets discounted back three time periods, four time periods, five time periods, we add it, that's NPV. That's what NPV is. It's the net present value. And when you do that for both things and you compare an NPV to another <coughs> NPV, you're comparing apples to apples as opposed to, you know, just adding things up. But, you know, you're, you're really doing the right thing. You're comparing them on equal footing, on equal basis. And what has happened with this is your really big number was only discounted back one time period. Here, your really big number is going to end up being discounted back five time periods. And so uh, this obviously gets a lower NPV than this one is going to have. Okay. okay, so in Excel, well, I didn't. In Excel, why am I doing NPV right now? Because we haven't even done the cash flows yet. Okay. It's like, I'm jumping ahead a little. Let's go ahead and finish the cash flows first. Then we'll do the NPVs on it. Okay, so in Excel, time zero okay, is going to be that time period that doesn't get anything discounted back, but it is a ne typically a negative number because it is when you typically do your initial investment. Okay. I can copy this across to the other cell. We'll come back to the time value stuff in a minute. Okay. In time period one, my cash flows that I'm trying to get, because that's what I'm trying to get here. I, I have five cash flows over here. I'm trying to get these cash flows because the idea is I'm going to do the same thing. Discount them back. I'm going to let Excel do it with the MPV functions. What I want is the net cash flow. I want the inflow minus the outflow. I need the net cash flow. This isn't a super complicated example with a ton of stuff in it. I only have one thing up here that qualifies as being an inflow to me, and what's that inflow? Production per unit time profit. The production times profit. times the unit profit. Yeah, that's our inflow. That's our our unit profit margin. We didn't even do revenues and costs. We just flat out put it as you know profit already. And so my ten thousand units at forty cents a unit. So my 10,000 units, 40 cents a unit, that is my inflow, okay? That's my inflow. So for me, that's B11 times B9, B9 times B11, whichever way you want to put it, okay? And I subtract from that anything that on here that's an outflow that I would have, okay? 
Well, my outflow, I don't have a lot of them on this sheet. It's kind of simplistic, but I do have one thing that's an outflow for me, and what is that? The maintenance cost of these machines, okay. Which here is $330, it's per machine, so I multiply it by the nine machines that I have. tiny because I meant to expand this a little before we did it. I'll expand it in just a second. I don't have to put these in parentheses if you know your precedence order of mathematical operators, but I separated them out to make them look clearer for us. B11 times B9, that's my inflow. Subtract from that B5 times B15, that's my outflow of maintenance per machine. Okay, okay. so that is, let's make this bigger because this is tiny and we need to get this stuff better. That is $1,030. So here's the thing. As much as possible, I want a model to be very, very flexible. I want to be able to make changes at different times, because we are going to do that when we do the, the what if analysis. I want to make changes at different times, and I want everything to uh, be able to update automatically. Well, I don't want to manually look at this and say, what years would I be putting this cash flow into? Did, well, for this machine, it's 10 years, and I would put it in all 10 years. But when I calculate this one, it would only be seven years because that's seven years, and I'd drag it down here and put zeros. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I want Excel to do that for me because if Excel does that for me, then that makes this more automated, okay, the whole thing more automated. So instead of me just putting this in here and myself figuring out which cells I'm going to put it into. I'm going to put an if statement in that's basically going to check to see what. Cell by cell, I know whether to put it there based on what. Am I going to put the calculation for this in year 10? because the life expectancy was only seven years. So the thing I have to know is what year am I in? Is it still within the life expectancy of this, of this project? Okay, so I'm gonna go around this calculation and put an if statement in that asks if, and luckily I have the year right there. Is the year that I am in right now less than or equal to the life expectancy of this machine. Is A19, the year that I'm in right now, less than or equal to B6, the life expectancy of this machine? Because if it is, then I will make that calculation we just talked about, okay? If it is, I will make that calculation of the cash inflow outflow to get the net cash flow. But if not, what would the cash flow be? done with the project, it'd be zero. So I'm going to check to see if the life, if the year that I am in is within the life expectancy of the machine. If so, then I will display the result of that cash flow. I will calculate that cash flow, inflow minus outflow, the net flow of whatever it was, $1,030. If not, then it's going to be zero because we will be done at that point. Now I did this in steps because I wanted to make sure first that I had the right calculation. Okay, first I had the right calculation. Now that I know how to have the right calculation, now I put the if statement around it to say I'm only gonna display that calculation when I'm still in the life expectancy of the machine. Otherwise it's zero. Okay. Is everybody good with this one? <coughs> but here's the other thing. I don't wanna type that 19 more times. I wanna copy it. I want to copy it here, I want to copy it there, there we go. So what do I have to do absolute reference wise when you're looking at, I'm going to click on these so you can see them better, what do I have to do absolute references up there? And, and on the rows for which ones? Six. Everything that's in column B. Everything is in column B. I want to put it on the rows, but not the column, because remember, when I copy it over here, I'm gonna want that to shift to B and C. So every one of these Bs 
needs a dollar sign in front of only the row. Okay, so every one of the B references needs a dollar sign in front of only the row so that this stuff doesn't shift down, but not in front of the column so that it will shift over. Anything else? Don't you have to make the A19 absolute on both the column and row? <coughs> Somebody said it over here. Just the column. Just the column. So we run our check, but just the column. And here's why. We do want this to move down to year two, year three, year four. But we don't, when we move this to this, we don't want that moving away. So the A19 does have to have it just in front of the A. And that made everything simpler for me. Because that one thing of dollar signs in front of every row on the B references, not in front of the Bs, though. And, and then just in front of the A of A19. And that makes it where I can copy this down and I can copy this over. And you see that it worked. Okay? You see that. You see that it didn't show up this one in year 8, 9, or 10. Why? Because it only had life expectancy of 7 years. But having it in here like this makes it way more flexible for any changes that we might put later on. <coughs> Instead of us manually saying, oh, well, I know this first one would have gone 10 years. I know this would have gone seven years. And then I just kind of do it myself. I've taken the flexibility out of the model when I do that. Okay, This is more flexible. Uh, changes can be made later. The life expectancy of this, we could learn, is you know only eight years. Boom. Now those are gone. Okay. So we want to be able to have things, you know, continue to work even if we discover that there are changes to be made. Okay. We go with cash flows because it is the cash flows, like those cash flows, that now allow us to be able to do these financial measures. And why I jumped ahead and, and talked about MPB because that really would be right now, but that's okay. I think I'm thinking about lunch, but anyway. We now already know that. That's what we're going to do here. We understand what NPV is doing. We understand why we need cash flows is because that's how NPV works is by discounting back appropriately. Okay. So we don't we don't know yet though, or maybe we do, maybe some people do, but we don't know how it looks when you're in Excel. Well, when you're in Excel, this is how NPV works. You do NPV, so it's super simple. That's the function name. That always helps you out when the function name is so logical. Okay, so NPV, and the first thing it wants you to put in is the rate. Okay, you're looking up there. There is a discount rate there. That is the discount rate that we're going to use. It's that 15% rate. It, this is not what you could put your money into, you know, a money market. <laughs> we would love that, but you definitely can't put your money in a money market and get 15%. That's not what the 15% is about. Where that number comes from, it's also often referred to as a hurdle rate. It's a rate that is kind of an expectation that you have. You know, your, your management has told you that when you're evaluating these projects, we're trying to at least get a 15% rate. In your industry, it's common to get a 15% rate. You have other projects you could be investing in that are 15% rate. You wouldn't do this one if it wasn't higher. So there are a lot of reasons why you come up with the hurdle rate that you come up with, or somebody gives you that. But that is our rate that we're comparing it against, is this 15% this rate. So I'm going to, you know, here where it says rate, I'm going to reference, of course, B13. And then you'll notice it says, well, now put in value 1, value 2, value 3, kind of like that, value 1, value 2, value 3. Well, ours are right here, value 1, 2, 3. I'm not going to enter them individually. I'm just going to put this range in. And so what I do, and this is an important thing about the NPV function, you've got to know the difference in how this and the next one works. When I put this in, I start at time 1 and go through time n, okay? I go through time n. So you're asking yourself, doesn't the initial investment mean anything in NPV? It absolutely does. In the real calculation of NPV, it, it, it makes a big difference. It's just that in the NPV function in Excel, you don't include it inside the function, you do it outside of the function. 
So we take this and we reduce it by the initial investment. Now you notice my initial investment is already negative, so I'm going to say plus that number. So yes, as a calculation of net present value, do I need to include initial investment? I absolutely do. Okay, But do I put it inside of the NPV function? No, because the, the NPV function is not set up that way. When it asks for value, it's asking for value in time period one, okay, through x, however many you go. If you did this the wrong way, if you put that in there, not outside, but you started with that range, I'm not saying you'd get a wildly different number. I, I think that it would depend on what these values actually are. But here would be the problem. It would be taking this number and discounting it back one and then this one two, and then this one three, and that's not right, okay? So it has, it knows what it needs, and it, it needs to start with one. The initial investment's done outside of that, okay? All right, so this is what we get, and, and you notice everything's lined up in this column, so I'm gonna be able to copy this to machine two, okay? We get a negative in PV. <coughs> Here, lining everything up, it's all good. We get a positive in PV. That negative number does not mean that this project, this machine, loses money. That's not what that a negative NPV is telling you. That's not it. Now, is this one better? Yes. Okay, that one's better. Okay, but it's telling you that this is a losing proposition here. No, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is it didn't meet your expectation of 15% rate of return. It didn't. Okay, and so therefore you're seeing a negative NPV. So that means if you have other things that can do better, we'll take them, you know. And in fact, if you have two positive NPVs, take the higher one, okay? That's got the better return. But this isn't telling you it's losing money. It's just telling you it did not meet your, your threshold of 15%. That's what it's telling you, okay? So what is the internal rate of return on this? That's what we're gonna figure out next. The internal rate of return on this is the function is IRR, so again, also very easy to remember, okay? So, because a lot of people just refer to it as IRR. Okay, so IRR, and here's the thing, here's what it needs. It needs the values, and then it says optionally, if you want to, you can put a guess in there. Oh, please, our problems aren't so big that we have to, you know, tell Excel where to start. Excel's pretty good at this, so we do not have to put a guess in there, but we do need to put the values in, and here's what you need to know that's different about IRR, you do start with time zero. IRR includes time zero through time n, okay? So you do put both in there, put both, uh, so both, the initial and then the cash flows. And in fact, IRR doesn't, IRR, if you remember this from finance, I don't know if you remember this or not, but IRR doesn't calculate